Good morning. Hey, Gail. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, thanks. All right. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for having us. It's going to be super fun. <laughs> well, um, I know there's a few more folks uh, probably going to be jumping on and joining us here shortly. Um, I know Julie is, uh, I just heard her come in and she should be jumping on here in the next few minutes. But um, Jacqueline, maybe we could go ahead and, uh, and do roll call. Okay, sure. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, just call your name if you can just say your name and your affiliation. Uh, Stevie? Rocky Mountain College, glad to be here. Great, thank you. Curtis? Curtis Smeeby, MSU Northern. Thank you, Gail. Gail Staffenson, Sydney, Montana. Thank you, Allison. Allison Harmon, Montana State University. All righty, Kirk. Good morning, Kirk Miller, School Administrators of Montana. Very good, Emily. Good morning, Emily Dean, um, Montana School Boards Association. All righty, McCall. Good morning, McCall Flynn, Board of Public Ed. All right, have I missed anyone? I don't think so. All righty, ready to start, Zach. All right, well, thank you. And just uh, for the record, I believe we have seven um, of our folks here uh, today, and we may have some more jumping on. That does not constitute a quorum. So as of right now, we can't uh, conduct any official votes. However, um, my assumption was uh, that that probably would not happen at this meeting, that this meeting would be more about um, just kind of discussing the crosswalk uh, that was requested at the September 30th meeting. Um, and then also just maybe outlining some next steps to wrap up this process and uh, mm -hmm. assign some roles and things like that. Uh, but we may have some more people jumping on here. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so, um, you know, I kind of, I guess I've just kind of outlined that. Um, as of right now, uh, I would like to try and wrap up for November by November 10th. I know that's a little tight. Um, we'll have to see uh, who all will be able to attend on that date. Kirk has already notified me that that may be problematic for him. And I would just note that um, that is, you know, normally it would be on the 11th. Uh, however, that is uh, Veterans Day, which is a state holiday. Uh, so I will not uh, be working on that day. Hopefully I'll be doing some hunting or something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at as of right now. Um, but hopefully after we talk through the crosswalk and get any feedback and thoughts on that, uh, maybe we can discuss some of that in a little more detail. So just a quick recap of um, the, the September 30th uh, meeting. Um, a lot of the, the discussion was around the timeline, um, some concerns uh, about the scope of the changes and um, you know, whether this was going too fast. Um, and then um, we did kind of get into the recommendations for subchapter six and seven that Stevie had put forth uh, with a respect to uh, alignment with CAPE. Um, and then um, there was some conversation about um, what would the ramifications be to some of those changes on chapter 57 and particularly um, subchapter four of uh, 57. And uh, out of that conversation uh, basically came um, a notion of we're going to pump the brakes on this for a little bit. We're going to ask OPI to uh, create a crosswalk uh, between those two things. Um, and I don't know if Julie's on uh, or not, uh, but just- Hi, a, Zach. Uh, oh, you are here. Okay, good. Welcome, Julie. Um, so uh, just a little bit about that crosswalk. Uh, Julie's going to uh, talk through it here in just a minute. Uh, I, I, I kind of started that process. I believe uh, everybody uh, should have seen that document. Um, essentially, I'll just make a couple uh, quick notes. Uh, so I uh, went through the, um, the, the master tracker document for chapter 58 and any changes um, in, in sections uh, three, six, or seven, um, I went to the relevant sections of subchapter four 
of chapter 57 and, and uh, Julie and uh, uh, Crystal Andrews and I kind of, you know, just identified those relevant sections and then I um, put the text in. Uh, also note that I kind of put the status with regard to uh, chapter 58, whether something had been voted on, had been discussed, was pending, that sort of thing. And then also, um, I would just note that the the stuff in chapter 57, it's important to remember that those recommendations have been finalized uh, by that task force. Um, and those whatever those recommendations are will be going forth uh, to the superintendent. So any discussion we have will really be um, with that in mind. Um, with that, um, if, I guess, are there any questions before I turn it over to Julie or comments? Okay. Um, in that case, um, and I can I can bring up the crosswalk, uh, Julie. Uh, I'd also like to to note that uh, Mary Descharm has joined us. Welcome, Mary. Glad you're here. Um, so I believe that gets us up to eight uh, task force members. But I can uh, I can share the crosswalk, uh, Julie, while you're talking through it, if that works. That's perfect, Zach. Thank you. Okay, give me just one second. <laughs> no, that's not what I wanted. Take me just a minute to find the right thing here, Julie. I'm sorry. You're fine. I can do it if you want, uh, Zach. I, oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good morning to each of you. Um, it is good to see all of you. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, walk through the, the crosswalk, kind of just do a really high overview, um, and then um, allow you guys to ask any questions if you have any questions of me in terms of uh, the chapter 57 section. Also, um, McCall at Flynn also has participated in both task force, so she would also be a great source of information uh, for any questions that, that the group might have. And so the way that Zach has set up uh, this crosswalk document is to first put into the first column all of the sections that you guys have been working on in chapter 58 and any recommendations that you've made so far um, and the status of that recommendation in the second column. And then we've taken that to um, kind of crosswalk and connect what portion that component um, is under in chapter 57. And then kind of um, outlining what really um, in particular are those areas of alignment uh, within each of those rules um, for us to be thinking about. So um, Zach, if you make that just a little bit bigger for us, that would be super helpful for my experienced eyes. So you guys, the first section is really in terms of the initial standards and the work that you guys have been doing around uh, the subchapter. 311 through 314 in chapter 58, which is about the initial content and pedagogical knowledge um, that is required that a provider is going to ensure that candidates receive. Um, and so that's really outlining, you know, what are those, what is that in particular, that content and ped pedagogical knowledge um, in A and B. And where that correlates over um, into 57 is really within what we call um, subchapter 1057, 410 is where it starts. And 410 in chapter 57 is the requirements uh, that outline what a candidate would need to do uh, to obtain a standard class two license. So uh, for a standard class two license, um, an individual needs to um, have a bachelor's degree from an accredited college. Uh, they need to complete an accredited EPP, including supervised teaching experience. Uh, the group within 57 has recommended a tiered system for this class two license based upon adding in 
a mentorship and induction component. So what you'll see here is that the recommended rule changes in the class two standard teaching license now is not just a straight two, but is a 2A and a 2B. The 2A is a non-renewable two-year license that gives um, a an individual time who's completed the EPP would be an individual potentially coming uh, straight out of one of your preparation programs uh, who's completed it and has completed also the required supervised teaching experience. Uh, they would get a 2A, which would enable them to have time to obtain and participate in a mentorship and induction program. Once that class 2A is completed and the mentorship is validated, then they would um, upgrade to a class 2B standard license, which is uh, um, eligible for five years and is renewable. Um, and that piece would be there. Um, and so part of this, you guys, is that if you have less than three years teaching experience and you come uh, from out of state and you have completed an EPP program and you have completed your experience supervised teaching and you have less than three years, then the task force um, uh, kind of built in here that you would be within the 2A um, needing to complete the mentorship and induction program as well. Uh, if you have more than three years, then you would be eligible to go to the 2B license. So, um, Zach, can you kind of scroll down a little bit and then I'll go to that alignment there. Um, so class two standard teaching license um, would uh, to obtain it. Uh, they would have to validate their bachelor's degree, validated, validate the EPP as we do now on a university recommendation. I'll keep going, Zach. Um, they would, uh, they need to have at least a one qualified endorsement on that license. They would have to verify completion of the EFA course. And then this is a component that's new that the team has uh, kind of put forward, uh, which is under E. Um, they call this a smorgasbord, but it's basically multiple pathways to demonstrate that content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge that you guys have over here in the 300s, which is to say you either need to, to demonstrate passing a praxis exam in the content area of, of the endorsement or obtain a 3.0 or higher in coursework in, in that coursework, including content and methodology courses uh, of a 3.0 or higher, or um, get a proficiency on a student portfolio that is verified by the EPP. And so those are kind of the pieces that they've outlined there for the 2A and the 2B. So Zach, back to the top there, so we can kind of look at in particular as we highlight and pull out, really where are those critical um, points that are connecting um, uh, from 410 and 424, which you guys, that's a provisional license, 424 is for a standard uh, teaching provisional license. You have to have attended an EPP accredited program. You have to qualify for that endorsement. You've got to have intro to Indian education for all which um, is required in 57, but not currently articulated in chapter 58. Again, proof of that component for number four under the multiple pathways to demonstrate that content and pedagogical knowledge. Keep going, Zach. And um, so, Yeah. And so then that's just kind of in particular, you guys, the alignment between 313 um, that goes there because 311 and 312 are about the, the program and then the um, clinical practice, if you will. So I want to pause there for a second, Zach, before we go into the next piece, but just really kind of wanted to share the recommendations coming out of chapter 57 to you all and kind of where those pieces are connecting between 311, 312, 313. 
Thank you. Julie, I would just um, make comments. So I, on the Google Doc, not on the DocX, on the, on the Google Doc, I went section by section through the cross mm -hmm. and made comments. And the comment that I'm making on the, the first section that is there is, you know, being unsure of the alignment of 57 and 58, the initial content and pedagogy and the 410 class two standard license topic, um, totally related to the praxis subject area school um, and whether that was actually resolved by chapter 57. I mean, I've, I've talked to several chapter 57 task force members and I understand that that vote was six to six to be able to use that. And so I'm unsure if that actually did did that pass the task force or? So Kirk, what you're talking about is not a three, it, what, what you're talking about is not 410. You're talking about 301. Okay, so 1057, 301, which is um, adding an additional endorsement. And so I think I made the comments down under 301 too that are closely related to what I just described. Yeah, so in that what you're bringing up, Kirk, though, is correct in terms of the task force did not come to a final uh, vote, if you will. It was a tie, um, and there was a group that you know kind of provided feedback as to why they felt an individual could add a second endorsement via praxis test, and may, maybe why why not. And so that um, has been shared with the superintendent for consideration to be thinking about why or why not. So that's under 301. And we can go there, Kirk, in just a second. I, um, we definitely will get there. But I, um, you have noted that somewhere, Kirk, on, a, on the Google sheet. Yeah, I yeah. evidently don't have the right one up here. But. Instead of the DocX, it's the actual Google Doc. Mm -hmm. That's where I wrote the comments. The Doc X wouldn't let let me write comments on. They didn't give you editor permission, Kirk. <laughs> I'll take that up with them. <laughs> so, um, do you want me then, Kirk? Since you're bringing it up, do you want to go down to that section now to 301 for the group to have a, maybe an opportunity to kind of look at what you're speaking about and talk about that? Whatever the preference of the group is, that's fine. There were several comments that I made in that on the doc, on the Google. Well, let me see if I can pull up the right one here. I can pull it up if you're struggling, um, Zach. If you can, that find would be it. awesome. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. Okay, I think this is it because I saw a comment down here. So uh, let me get to it. I'll move the screen in a moment. Oh, missed it, missed it. Sorry about that. So Jacqueline, the, the right document would have comments on the first page in purple font. Oh, all right. Uh oh. Let me let me just try going back into my Google Drive here. That's that, interesting. The, okay. link, the link that I sent you in the email goes directly to the Google Doc. The email exchange that we had day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. I guess I could put that in the chat, couldn't I? I can here. I can find that. So I just put the link to that Google Doc in the chat. I have, I'll have it here in a second. Okay, Kirk, now let me just. Um... 
it works. They're there. So let me see if I can uh, make this bigger, but there's Kirk's comment. Okay, so Kirk, as um, I mentioned, right, this is, uh, when we look at this crosswalk, this is not in particular to 57, uh, 410, um, but it is in uh, 1057, 301. So if Zach, you could scroll down to this section in the third column that references 301. Okay. It's, um, hold on. It's a little slow for some reason. Right there. So just a little bit more up, I think, from my view, and then we can take a look at um, Kirk's comments there. Okay. So, okay. So you're correct in terms of um, Kirk from 58, 311 through 315, right? Um, from 58 also connects with 301 which is how an endorsement um, is um, applied to a license. So uh, the first one of 301 is that endorsements um, on a Montana teaching license are only endorsements that are approved by the Board of Public Ed. And in order to uh, get an initial endorsement granted by the Superintendent of Public Instruction, um, an individual must get that via uh, completing an EPP program um, that is verified by a uh, official, appropriate official uh, from an EPP program. Um, the part that was proposed and has not been resolved, Kurt, um, which you are kind of talking about there is number three, is what about um, folks who want to add, add an additional endorsement and have already have a license and attended an EPP program and have one endorsement, is there a way that they could add a second endorsement uh, to their license in, a, in more than one way? Could they do it via passing a Praxis content exam? Could they do it by going back to um, an EPP program and adding that additional endorsement and completing um, that EPP program for that particular piece? Um, or third, if they actually had a degree in that particular endorsement um, outside of their teaching credentials, could that be another mechanism used to add an endorsement? So Kirk's comments there are in purple. So I guess it would probably be good Zach, to pull those up, and Kirk, take, why don't you take it from here on what your thoughts were? Yeah, so I, first of all, I didn't understand <coughs> why the word or was highlighted, and if that was intended to be an and. In other words, you have to pass the paraxis for that content area and a recommendation for endorsement and or, or the bachelor's degree from a higher ed, so... I was, I was unsure of the word, why that was highlighted and if that should be an and, and that's what the debate is in chapter 57 with the task force. So um, the debate right now, Kirk, is um, not the or, it is the or, is that that is intentionally meant to be there. That's the discussion. It's not all of these things. Um, it's not an and, it's an or. Um, and so that was part of the conversation was yeah. that in Montana, there are a lot of folks who teach in high schools where um, having two endorsements is really um, necessary and very important 
simply because um, the class sizes, you know, and the student enrollment count to be able to teach two different kinds of endorsements. Is it possible that a person could could add an endorsement if they've already, you know, completed their teaching methodology program, have obtained an endorsement in an area, have done that supervised teaching experience, um, and kind of know some of that content knowledge and best practices, um, how to work with kiddos, have those foundational skills and all of that, and add that endorsement, not by obtaining it, rather a minor or an additional endorsement through schoolwork, but rather to take a praxis. Um, and so the conversation was or. Um, and part of that is, um, that is an option in many states um, that do allow folks to add endorsements via testing basically, Kirk, to test out on that content to add that endorsement for secondary. So um, it has not been resolved. <laughs> it's sitting there right now as an or. There were folks who felt like, on the other side of that, Kirk, was that um, they didn't feel like it's okay to just um, uh, take, for example, um, and, and take a test if the content area is so different from the, if you will, vi not, not kind of parallel, not so close, if you will, but is so vitally different that um, taking coursework would be the best route is what they had felt. So for example, if you are a math teacher and you wanted to add an agricultural endorsement, that those two are so different in the content and in the methodology that just passing a test maybe for, you know, um, for mathematics, um, when you've been prepared to be an egg teacher, there may be, may be some pieces that you're not prepared to the degree that they, they would want. So that was kind of the debate if you will, and it was a tie. Um, and so um, we're gonna be going to CISPAC on Tuesday, I think. <laughs> I don't know when the third is, when's the third? Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday. yay. So um, yeah, so the call. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, I um, actually, unfortunately, wasn't there for that vote, but I did go back and listen to it because I did hear that there was maybe some confusion around it. And I I certainly don't want to, you know, have a back and forth with this because I, I do think at the end of the day, the, our task forces are proposing recommendations to the superintendent. And if the superintendent wants it to be an or, she gets it to be an or as we go to CISPAC at least. So I think that it's going to be really important for those that either participate in the task force um, or who are you know, paying close attention to this to come to CISPAC or come to the board and explain why they think it should be different. Um, or, or to say, we like the or. So I, I think that's an important piece of this too, um, that not all the time are the recommendations that we make as task force members probably going to be the same when they make it to CISPAC. All right. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I, you know, I would just point out again with the process. I think the crosswalk is very valuable here because it brought to light, you know, a, a delicate issue that's out there. And I'm sure members of the fifth, Chapter 58 Task Force would have an opinion about that, or or an and <clears throat> um, as related. And also that I think that it's very important that the complete task force recommendations that are given to the superintendent and then the differences that um, the superintendent is making a recommendation to CISPAC would be known to the individual task force. Okay, just, just to know what the, you know, here's the recommendation the task force was put together by the superintendent uh, to advise what the issues are and then we voted, you know, in chapter 58, just spe specifically about that for recommendations to the superintendent. And then the superintendent is going to take those recommendations uh, to CISPAC and ultimately to the Board of Public Ed. And so the knowledge base of the task force to know 
what the differences are between the complete recommendation in this case of chapter 58 to the superintendent and what the superintendent then recommended to to CISPAC, I think is an important function of the task force so that we would know um, what those differences are. Yeah, so Kirk, we'll be sharing with CISPAC and have shared with the superintendent that six people voted for the or and why, okay. <laughs> and six people voted against it and why. Yeah, because it was a tie. Right, right, so thank <laughs> you, Julie, you know, I. Uh, yeah. yeah, emphasize yeah. the great work that's being done by the team who's putting this together. Your depth of knowledge, Julie, of the technicalities of all of those issues gives me um, a sense of uh, satisfaction or a sense of it's okay because there is there are folks that do know that this is what the differences are between what the recommendations are and um, are trying to ferret out those differences so that clean recommendations can be made to to mm -hmm. CISPAC so that they can clearly vote on um, yeah. you know changes to rule which initially when I said I think we needed the crosswalk this is the very thing that I wanted to make sure was pointed out that mm -hmm. we have to be very careful in rulemaking on these on these chapters and chapter 55 and 56 when we get to, when when that happens because yeah the import of what happened here does affect the other chapters yeah. and, and the, the ability to implement. And I've just experienced it too many times uh, mm -hmm. to know. And so what I will say is that your ability to put the crosswalk together uh, here and to really technically look at the difference would be in you know, sub chapter four or 57 and the chapter 58 different sections that uh, relate to subchapter four it, it was important, and I think that you did a nice job with that. And short of just the comments that are there, which led to you know ten minutes worth of dialogue here uh, to get to the bottom of how it exists and how it's going to be recommended, I think is an important function of the task force. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a, a you know a really good important conversation next week with CISPAC as well. Um, to um, share with them, quite frankly, that it's that this piece right here that we're talking about, Kirk, is a tie. And um, so it's part of that conversation to say, what are the implications, right? Um, either way, what are the positives? What are the negatives, drawbacks, um, if, if it is allowed to be an or or not? Yeah. So I think that'll be an important piece. Okay, I want to go back up. Um, we kind of passed a couple of different sections. I just wanted to highlight, Kirk. Um, because there are a few other areas that I do think are important um, in terms of um, the alignment uh, with 58. So um, looking at 412, so speaking of endorsements, um, and this relates, you guys, to the or do we need to go back up a little bit further? Because we have a couple of more sections in 57 for with the administrative piece. Um, keep going. I'm just, I'm, it's hard for me to <laughs> know where I'm at here. Okay. This is the top here, so. Okay. So we talked about 410, which was the standard teacher license. Okay, so keep going down a little bit. Um, oh, and then it's, yeah, I know, okay. And then, okay, so 424 is the provisional license. Um, and so if we could kind of stop there, Zach, at the top of 424 to talk about the provisional, because we've sure. talked about the two, which is the standard teaching license. So um, a provisional um, is for folks who have not completed the EPP program um, and need to get those teaching credentials and hold a bachelor's degree um, from a regionally accredited school. Um, and so when the mentorship and induction uh, program component was introduced and recommended, 
Um, it kind of also had impacts on the provisional license, which brought in a couple of tiers there as well. So uh, they're proposing three different types of provisional license, a 5A, which we already have, which is for someone who meets all the requirements but hasn't passed the praxis. That would still be true because if someone has um, completed an EPP program and didn't pass the praxis, um, had a GPA lower than a 3.0 in their EPP programming, um, or didn't have an opportunity maybe because their program didn't have a student teaching portfolio to get that as a recommendation, um, then they're gonna need, to, maybe potentially could be some folks that needs to still have that 5A, meaning some time to, to demonstrate that content knowledge via the praxis. Um, also, there could be somebody who does, um, complete the EPP program, obtains their standard teaching to a license and for some reason doesn't complete the mentorship and induction program, may need um, some additional time to do that. So that's what the 5A is for, is for additional time to demonstrate that content knowledge or additional time to complete that mentorship and induction program, but for somebody who does meet all of those EPP requirements and done an EPP program, has an endorsement, and has um, the student, um, the um, experienced teacher, supervised experience teaching experience. Um, the B is kind of what we traditionally know a, a provisional to be, which is granting someone three years who's already um, a resident in Montana or hired for a job in Montana, um, but does not have the EPP program um, to give them three years to complete that program. Whereas the 5C uh, is for recency. That's for somebody who already holds a um, out-of-state license, but it's expired and they don't have uh, six semester credits within the last five years. Uh, the um, notion here is for the 5C to give them that three years to complete that recency. Um, and it's been ex proposed to expand that to not only be uh, six semester credits, but also to include the option for professional development units and continuing education. Um, and so it, it is um, being proposed as 60 uh, professional development units, which could include semester credits and or professional development or combination thereof. And so this goes through and talks about um, in 424, what are the requirements that a person has to demonstrate and provide to get a provisional license? Allison, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, I am curious about the criteria for the mentorship and induction program and where we will find those in the standards and so that it can be enforced, I guess. Yeah, so it would be appearing, um, a definition is being proposed in chapter one. It's actually 1057-102 is to add the definition for mentorship um, and induction aligned to the definition that already exists in chapter 55. So um, I don't know if I, um, Allison, I'm gonna put it right in the chat if that's okay. So you can see what the proposed definition for that is, and then where it relates to chapter 57. Give me one second here. Thanks, Julie. You bet. So again, you guys, your, your 311 through 315 relates not only to the standard teaching license, but also to the provisional. So the definition being proposed is, Okay, Allison, I put that in the chat there. So 
So mentorship and induction is already defined in chapter 57. So this is linked to it. Okay, Zach, you want to um, keep scrolling unless Allison had I think Emily has her hand up. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Oh, that's okay. Um, I had a kind of a process question, and I didn't listen to all of the 57 conversations, but um, just from what I've been able to gather um, from other members, I so I'm I'm I guess I'm confused on some of the tie votes since a tie would indicate that it failed. Um, and so I'm just curious about, you know, how, what the process is then with, um, I guess things remaining an option, um, even though it failed. So Emily, um, in terms of, well, I think the 301 endorsement, it didn't pass, nor did it fail, but the mentorship passed. There was not a tie on the mentorship. Um, so I get well, and I and someone on fifty seven can correct me if I'm wrong. But for for example, the um, the making the praxis optional is that going to be included then, since that was a tie, which would indicate it failed. Making the praxis optional, um, am, are you, just to help me understand here, clarify where you're talking in particular. Um, so Zach, can you pull up to the top of that chart into the section under 410 again? So the praxis, um, are you talking about um, in order for someone to demonstrate that initial content and pedagogical knowledge, there's three different ways, multiple ways they can do it. They can do it via the praxis, they can do it via um, a portfolio or through um, what was the other one? I'm sorry, you guys. Um, or through an EP, completing an EPP program for that endorsement. Um, so no, what were there were three options? I'm sorry, I have to see it. Um, I don't have it up big here. Sorry, There's guys. EPP um, portfolio and praxis. Okay. So GPA portfolio and praxis. So are and, you talking about? And this about is where that? there was the, the tie, correct? No, there was no tie on the on multiple pathways that passed. Okay, can you remind me where the tie was then? The tie is on Emily for endorsements on a 301, meaning if you can add a second endorsement, not your initial endorsement, but rather an additional endorsement. So you've already completed an EPP program, for example, and um, say it's in science the option to allow someone to add a mathematics via taking the praxis exam and passing the content knowledge in math would uh, potentially enable them to add the to add that mathematics endorsement to their license that they already hold for science uh, okay. for 512. So that's where the tie is, um, is folks, folks who were in favor of allowing folks that ability to add that second endorsement or third endorsement. Okay. Um, and then the other one was uh, for uh, what they felt was like that, why they didn't think that was, was a good thing to do. So Jules here, and she wants to know if she can speak. We have, we do have two uh, the task force folks, uh, uh, Stevie and Susan also have their hands up. I'd be glad to let her speak first before my comments, if that's what you want, Zeb. Okay. Go ahead, Joel. Good morning, everyone. I, do, I just want to clarify that we did take a vote um, on the chapter 57. Um, there were three at one point. Um, it was about the mentorship being attached to the license. And that was a five to eight vote um, for the um, 
provisional language, it went five to nine, um, five yes, nine no. And then on another vote that day, there was uh, a vote on the teacher licensure uh, for the state of Montana to remove or retain the praxis. That went on a six to six vote, just for clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Jewel. Uh, Stevie, go ahead. Okay, well, thanks, Jewel, for that. Um, more questions, I guess, for me. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate that the definition is already in rule, but my question is about um, verification of an induction or mentorship. If someone's getting a, a a, a provisional license based on that, how will the rule provide um, verification? Since it's already been there and it may or may not be happening, now that we add it to 57, what will the, what will the mechanism be to verify that a candidate has completed that and to what level? So Stevie, if that got put into rule, then we'd have to implement a process to validate, if you will, completion of successful mentorship program. Um, and it would probably come from a uh, school district, from a superintendent or a principal, principal or supervisor who can validate that yes, indeed, um, the person completed the mentorship program. So similar to a university recommendation form, where we um, obtain, if you will, verification that someone has completed an EPP program um, that is not necessarily written into rule that we have the process of using a university recommendation and it goes to the, you know, we talk about an authorized representative. Um, we would have to put into place that someone would have to get the validation, if you would, of a mentorship program. Um, process somehow to validate that in order for them to progress from the 2A to the 2B. So it would be up to each individual school district to define what that process is and consists of, and then, and then an official to sign off that it, whatever it is has happened. Yeah, I'm sure it would involve that, Stevie, absolutely. Okay. Because it would be a new process that is not currently in practice, if you will. Okay, thanks for that. And then going back to, to Emily's comments and Kirk's comments about the OR, um, is, is it correct that my understanding with Robert's rules is if there's a tie, it fails, as, as I think Emily was suggesting. Um, but regardless of what the committee feels about their vote, it's true that the superintendent can look at these recommendations and do what she believes is appropriate, but will it go back to chapter 57 and will the recommendation to CISPAC next week be an or, or will it be presented as a choice and CISPAC will decide? What, ha what happens with that or, which is only two letters, but is extremely important in moving forward. Yeah, um, you know, uh, we'll come to sis back with, you know, um, what, what is, uh, what's been recommended from the task force to the superintendent, um, and then uh, for her to consider, you know, what, um, what feedback comes from sis back um, in her final recommendation that goes to the Board of Public Ed. Okay, thank you. I believe Susan has her hand up. Yeah, and I apologize if you already, I had to step out, so I'm sorry if you already talked about this, but um, uh, teachers on a class five who are um, unlicensed, so they're getting their, they're in a, with a university and they're taking both teacher licensure and a special ed endorsement. Uh, are they still held to the three year under a class five? Yes, Susan, if um, 
there's no recommended changes for that. So if you have a bachelor's degree um, and you um, uh, get a job as a special education teacher and need to complete an EPP program, you would be given three years to complete your EPP program for special education. Well, um, my comment is that that's actually punishing to those individuals because um, we've had candidates in our program that have been hired in districts that have had difficulty finding a special ed teacher. They're hired to teach special education. And so obviously they have to get their teaching license through us as well as their special ed endorsement. So we are expecting them to take um, two classes more than all of the, uh, a semester, more than all of the other uh, teacher candidates who are just getting their teaching license. And I'm afraid that it's a disincentive for people when they realize how many courses they have to take every semester when they're filling a need, which the state is very desperate for, which is special education teachers. It would have been, um, it would have been nice to have accommodated, um, made accommodations for those um, teacher candidates by giving them an extra year um, on their journey to become a licensed, special education teacher. Thank you, Susan, for your for your comment. I think that um, what you bring up is really a critical piece when we think about our special education teachers and um, we think about the, the difficulty in many cases of finding qualified special education teachers um, and the, the degree and amount of programming that they must um, engage in to, to earn that endorsement, that critical endorsement, if you will. Um, that is, is, is essential to be able to serve those students at the, the highest degree. Um, and it is, is a lot, you're right. And they, um, they have to do two student teachings. So typically what happens is they are teaching in their special education classroom, which they were hired for. They have to take a leave of absence to complete their regular education teaching. Um, and the school has to accommodate that in some way. And at the same time, we're saying they still have only the three years that other um, candidates under class five have. That's why I would have liked to have seen a little bit more flexibility for those people who are um, under a class five getting their um, license and special education endorsement. All right, Thanks, Susan. thank you, Susan. I just wanna make a quick note. Um, Julie will have to jump off here in just a, about five minutes or so. Uh, she's got another meeting. Um, so Julie, is there anything in particular with this that you would like to highlight before you jump off? Anything else? Yeah, the, there is on that crosswalk sec for you guys to continue to look at um, the crosswalk between uh, the administrative license and the advanced programming that you guys have in your subchapters for six and seven. But I think probably the part, Zach, I wanna really quickly, if you don't mind, is if you could pull up your guys' uh, subchapter five for endorsements. Um, because there's some places where the language does not uh, completely match up, if you will. Yeah, give me just a second to find that. So Kirk, I see your question there. Um, there was a point at which there was a conversation with the task force where the, the comment about, do we, do we require the praxis? Um, as a yes or a no, um, but that was preceding uh, the final rule uh, recommendations for 410, where the group then said they wanted to look at multiple pathways rather than removing it or adding it. 
it was looking at multiple pathways. So um, it's kind of like a, a vote on top of a vote. So um, I think that it's <clears throat> very difficult to say that, okay, there was a tie that they said, we're not gonna require it or require it for the praxis. What the, what the task force ended up making their final recommendations were, was to allow a pathway to say, if you can demonstrate one of these three things, GPA, portfolio, or praxis. So I don't think that technically, right, that there's language coming forward that they didn't vote on. It's just that things evolved through the process where initially the conversation was simply on the praxis as a component uh, <clears throat> to get the teacher's license, yes or no which then kind of evolved into what did that mean when we got to <clears throat> the portfolio. Thank you. So I, I just kind of, you know, the timeline and tracking of how that kind of moved, if you will. So there's no way to go back now and say to that task force, if you will, well, you have to take away the multiple pathways because you voted at some point in time as a tie for the praxis because they moved beyond that and expanded that thinking. I get it. So the, okay. the only thing that's left hanging out there is a six to six failed vote on the word or in the additional endorsement area, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Which is using the praxis to get an endorsement. So you guys really quick on the languages for, um, oh, not that tracker. <laughs> The one that I had the language for chapter five really quick, because I got one minute, you guys, I got to be on at another meeting. Um, what I want you guys to look at is the alignment of the endorsements. I put in green there. That was the right document that we had up. Okay. I thought you were talking about this, the other one. So you guys, I highlighted in green where we're changing some language that doesn't line up. So like um, we're putting in and recommended it to change from age three to grade three to P3. Um, so that's why that's green. Keep going, Zach, really quick. Uh, we have it listed as K8 in 532, but again, that's not, not language that's mirrored in 58. Um, you guys have in 509 language arts, but we don't have it listed as a, um, a as that English slash language arts. Um, English as a second language K12, um, that's listed as an endorsement uh, that we have in 57, but is not addressed in sub chapter five of 58. Keep going down the list. Um, Again, PE is listed as an endorsement as K-12, but it's not written that way in uh, subchapter five for you all. And then I highlighted political science and government um, because it's listed as an, as an extra course uh, for in your guys' subchapter for a broad field uh, social studies, but we don't use that term government we use political science. And so I don't know <laughs> like what we would do to try to line up that language there. Um, keep going. Sick, uh, school counseling has been moved over there. You guys have the endorsement for special, we have it listed as an endorsement in special ed for 510. And you guys reference 510 as students with disabilities. Um, and then we have endorsements in special ed for hearing impairment, vision impairment, and then there's been a conversation about American Sign Language. So these are the endorsement areas where um, there's some language, if you will, that doesn't necessarily line up. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out. Okay, I'm gonna jet, I am so sorry, you guys. Um, Zach is here, he certainly can answer any more questions that you have. I appreciate the dialogue and I appreciate your guys' input, um, especially as we're starting to think about for 57 moving forward in the next step. And we'll keep you posted and um, certainly let Zach know if there's some questions you would like um, us to follow up on from the chapter 57 world. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Julie. Zach, if you would just keep going down on that document, I'd make comment. I think if you still have that, 
So I was unsure of what the green indicated. Julie just explained what that is. And then, you know, I think the recommendation from chapter 58 is that we needed subject area specialists that weren't included on the task force to do a deep dive on all of those endorsement areas. That was, you know, what we've talked about as a task force and that that's going to take some more time. But through that process, I think we really got to be careful about aligning all the language between chapter 58 and chapter 57 related to endorsements as we, as we move forward. Um, just again, my comments on what Julie just, just explained and um, that's not going to happen by November 10th or, or whatever, you know, there's, there's extended work I think that needs to be done so that that, that can be completed. We need subject matter experts as uh, our colleagues from the university system that are on this task force have, you know, very much stated that we need to get others involved that understand the, the content and the pedagogy that's necessary for each one of those endorsement areas so that um, the language aligns. And actually, if I'm seeing that <laughs> the language and what we call it becomes pretty important. And as long as we're modernizing what's happening in chapter 58 and 57, we should use <clears throat> the modernized language for each one of those endorsement areas. All right, thank you, Kirk. And before I uh, respond to that, is does anybody else have comments about what Kirk's just shared? Okay, Allison. Well, just that I agree with what Kirk said. I mean, we do need it. We do need those content experts involved, and that might take some time. Mary, are you trying to raise your hand? You're muted. Oh. It may be that she's talking to someone else. I can't tell. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, All right. So a couple things. Um, you know, I think there's a couple approaches that uh, that you all as a task force could take here. Uh, one would be uh, that, uh, as you know, uh, the, the process that, that OPI has laid out is that these uh, chapters will be visited with more frequency, uh, that it won't necessarily be every, I believe it's seven years. Um, so, you know, if uh, as a group, you wanted to look specifically at those uh, those CAPE alignments in subchapters six and seven, and try to write that write that work up, wrap that work up, um, you know, by November tenth or or some sometime close to that, um, and sort of put the uh, specific endorsement areas, um, you know, uh, for a future date. Um, you know, that might be an option. I guess I would be curious to know, Kirk. Uh, how long would you anticipate uh, this would take uh, to get those experts involved? I have started that process of reaching out to folks. Um, my intention was uh, at the conclusion of today to provide a list to everybody of uh, sort of those areas where we don't have a uh, content expert identified and, um, you know, request um, some assistance in identifying those people. Um, you know, the, what was envisioned by, um, by OPI and leadership, uh, Julie and Cheryl and myself, was that, you know, if we were to sort of chunk that out to folks um, in those areas that looking at those different, you know, sets of standards wouldn't be uh, that cumbersome of a task. Um, that being said, I, I um, you know, I, I will acknowledge that there's been a theme here in this group that um, you know, they feel like a lot of this is going too fast. Um, but to me, um, the, the options would be either to say, okay, uh, these endorsement areas, this is, this is too, um, too much uh, to undertake in the timeframe that we have. Um, 
And so therefore we'll just focus on, on wrapping up six and seven. And I would, um, and also I would just note that hanging out there kind of um, our counselors and school uh, psychologists, because Stevie did not address those in the work that she did. Um, so those are still there. Uh, or, um, you know, to look at a little bit of an extended timeline, but um, I would say that we don't want to go too much further because uh, we need to wrap this up. But ultimately, you are the task force. You're making the recommendations um, with respect to uh, Chapter 58. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll let folks weigh in on that. I guess I'll, I'll weigh in here a little bit. I, I think that, you know, maybe the suspending during this time period of collecting content area specialists to go through each one of those endorsement areas um, and not delaying the process of going forward with what has been presented. I'm, I would, as a task force member, I would be fine with that. Uh, I think it is a, a much bigger task than, and I, but I agree, you know, chunking it together and having people that have great knowledge to really take a look at each one of those endorsement areas and make a recommendation. Um, but in the past, when we've done that, I mean, that takes like a year of facilitated meetings uh, with each of the different groups. I, that's how it happened the last time um, there was a review of those endorsement areas. Uh, and there was significant resources that were spent by the Office of Public Instruction and in gathering, you know, small groups of eight to 10 on each one of the content area to really do a deep review of that with facilitated meetings and move forward. I'm not saying it has to be done like that. I'm just saying that's how it was done in the past. And that took just that part of it took a year uh, to make that happen. And I, I'm not so sure that it isn't valuable to do something like that because as we're seeing the modernization of language and the changes that are currently happening for uh, endorsement areas and what's more contemporary now probably does need to be reviewed. So maybe that's set aside for you know, a separate piece of work that gets done over the next year uh, after the recommendations are made here. Um, you've asked that I, you know, take a look at um, the superintendent, principal, and specialist areas that are a part of that, those endorsement areas, you know, and that physically is setting aside enough time to really review the way that it's written and what's ha currently happening in practice. And I may not be the, you know, the only, just my voice isn't the only expert that should be in on that. I think our leadership programs and those that, you know, provide the, um, the coursework and the Ed leadership programs really have a deep understanding of <clears throat> what should be required to accomplish that endorsement. And so, you know, that's just a small example, just those three areas of the kind of work that I think needs to be done. Um, I will qualify that if we went, if we went down further on this document, I do, uh, when we get to the class three endorsements and what's coming out of chapter 57, a deep review, I do support the recommendations coming out of chapter 57. And you, you could even pan down on this document and get to 413. Um, and just again, in a technical sort of way, when we review what's been recommended, um, the essence of what's been recommended by chapter 57, uh, specifically for uh, the superintendent, um, to gain a license is to include Montana school law, uh, Montana finance, and Montana collective bargaining and employment law, um, but leave it to the EPP, to the Ed leadership program, to be able to structure the coursework uh, that would be available for those from out of state um, to to offer that coursework and it might not be three credits in each one of those areas. That was the recommendation of the recruitment and retention licensure subcommittee of which Allison chaired <laughs> that went to the superintendent uh, way back in February. And that literally is in rule. If, we, if you pan down you know, to um, 
414, the class three, where you see the three credits has been struck and that it includes the Montana Educator Preparation Program requirements around those, the, the areas that I described and leaves it to more flexibility for the education preparation program, the ed leadership program that our university system to be able to offer um, that maybe a couple of courses chucked together or one course that uh, addresses all of the issues that a superintendent would need to know specific to Montana finance, employment law, collective bargaining and, and school law. So again, I, I'm sorry, there's a lot of technical things that are involved there. Uh, but it, there have been some good movements. And so I, I wouldn't want to see a delay. I think that like you described, Zach, we should move forward with the things that we have accomplished and make those recommendations. Uh, and that I think that we should leave the 1057-301 endorsement area and those related sections in chapter 58 um, for more time to to really get into it and do a good review of what those endorsement areas should uh, should represent. All right, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts and your considerable expertise with this, Kirk. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I have a couple other people I think want to weigh in. We'll start with Susan. Um, I just wanted to, uh, it was interesting hearing what Kurt said about the process seven years ago and how much time was spent on looking at the content areas and in using experts for that. That is in stark contrast to what's happening now because, I mean, I, I would be happy, as I think you've asked me, to look at the special education, but I am not going to presume I'm the content expert for the whole state. And it would, I'm not going to take that upon myself if, there isn't a discussion with the other universities that also prepare um, candidates in that area. And so, um, and plus, I mean, there, there certainly isn't enough time at this point. Um, it just seems that there wasn't enough forethought about how long this would take to bring in different content experts and have a representation from across the state to do that. So I presume we're gonna to have to just leave that until the superintendent decides that we're going to do this again, not in seven years, but maybe, I don't know, two or three. I don't know what she's thinking. All right, thank you for sharing your thoughts, uh, Susan. Um, and I just, I, I wanna let Mary uh, also chime in here in a moment. I just, I do wanna say we have about 15 minutes um, uh, just uh, to, to move us forward in this process. I would like to, uh, be, before we uh, wrap up today, maybe we can take a vote on this, uh, just so this, that particular decision point has, has been made by this task force. Um, you know, we've had folks weigh in, but ultimately it would require a vote. And I would note um, that since we started, we have had a few folks uh, join us and we do have a quorum, but go ahead, Mary. <clears throat> okay, as regards to content area and um, <clears throat> categorizing people with disabilities, you know, um, Down syndrome, uh, Okay, for instance, there's, I always wanted to say comorbidities. There's comorbidities, Down syndromes often have vision problems. Autism often have auditory processing problems. Maybe we at least mention someplace um, universal design learning um, and, you know, especially in the special education sphere. So. Okay. Appreciate you sharing your thoughts, uh, Mary. Any other comments, questions? Um, oh, there's McCall. Thanks, Zach. I would just make 
uh, one more comment, and it's something that I've talked a lot about, but I think for this group, it's just really important as we continue to move forward. I, I just want to reiterate, I think, how important it is to ensure that we keep 58 intact when it goes to both CISPAC and the board. I think it's really important that all of those recommendations are presented at the same time under 58. Um, so I, I just wanted to reiterate that because I do think it's a really, really important piece of this process and not trying to piecemeal it and chop it up, but, um, and instead present it all at the same time. So just wanted to put in that plug again. Thank you. Thank you, McCall, for sharing that. Um, is there anyone that has strong objection, I guess, to, to, to um, trying to decide this question within the task force today as to um, what will be wrapped up essentially um, between now and the, and the 10th or, or maybe a date shortly thereafter, but um, with regard to the specific endorsement areas. So what I've heard uh, from Kirk and I believe Allison and, uh, and Susan as well uh, is that uh, they feel that we're just, uh, we don't have the time uh, and we haven't uh, consulted, and, you know, we don't have time to bring the proper expertise to bear with regard to uh, fleshing out some of these recommendations to the specific endorsement areas outlined in subchapter five. Um, we have, um, you know, some recommendations for uh, subchapters uh, six and seven uh, that have been basically brought forth by Stevie. Um, that uh, we have not been voted on. Uh, that work is essentially done um, and you know, potentially could be uh, addressed uh, when we meet again. Um, but I guess what I'm asking is, um, does anybody object to sort of uh, going on record as to whether or not uh, the endorsement areas in subchapter five uh, will be addressed by this task force uh, in this time frame or not? Steve. Um, Zach, can you give us a little bit of an idea about what background work you have done and gathering people who could work on it? I, I just don't know that I understand the scope of what, what we're asking to get done. I, I, I love McCall's um, reminder to keep the, the process intact for those people that have to work on it after us, but I just want to know how you are going with finding experts. And I, I know you said you're going to send something out to us, but... Is <laughs> Is it a beginning? Um, <laughs> I haven't got to it as much as I had hoped to. Um, obviously, uh, this process I thought was going to be done by now, and I have some other things, um, not to make excuses, but um, what I have done is I've reached out to folks uh, in OPI who have expertise in these areas in science and um, some of the uh, CTE fields uh, like agriculture, uh, traffic education, uh, business, things like that, um, to have them look at the, the two sets of standards, uh, the document that I shared, uh, you know, some time ago that kind of outlines that the what's in ARM in Montana versus what the national standards say for those areas, um, and have asked them to start um, looking at those and providing recommendations. I did reach out to Kirk, um, as he referenced. I also... Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, Kari is on. Um, she had uh, quite some time ago uh, graciously volunteered uh, to um, look at health and PE. Uh, Susan, I believe she referenced special ed. Um, so that's, you know, I've sort of circled back to that and, and asked folks um, if they could do that. Um, I do recognize that it is a tight timeline. So I guess the problem for me in voting is I'm not sure what I'm voting for. Are we talking about something that we would all agree upon would be an adequate time frame to start the project? Uh, what, what I was, I guess what I was, maybe I can be more um, concise. Uh, what I was saying is voting to not address those endorsement areas in subchapter five within the, within this task force at this time. So what I was asking was, does anybody have strong objection to taking that vote today 
so that we can sort of use that to shape you know what is going to happen going forward kirk yeah i would just ask mccall you know if you believe that uh, the pulling out of the five 500 sub chapter basic or the 300 sub chapter of 57 and the related sub chapter of chapter 58 would cause great harm to the ability to uh, I, mean, I, I think that's pretty contained we're looking at endorsements basically um, and I, I don't know that that would cause harm to the rest of the recommendation, which I think we should vote today on uh, subchapter six and seven and the work that Stevie and group has done in making those chapter 58 recommendations. So just a question, McCall, do you believe that pulling that out um, fractures the ability for CISPAC to, to take a look in the Board of Public Ed to take a look at um, the chapter 58, the rest of chapter 58? You know, Kirk, I'm not sure that maybe I should be the one to make that decision. I think that because this is the board's process that they've put forward, and I'm not sure that we've, you would know better than I would if this has ever happened, if we've kind of taken these in pieces. Um, but I would be inclined to say I, I wouldn't want to see that. I think it's really important to see the whole picture at once. But with that said, I mean, if if you all have strong opinions that you feel like it could be one way or the other, I think that I could certainly approach the board and ask if they're interested in that process, but I'm not sure that I'm I'm the one to make that determination. So I think we could still vote here on what's being proposed, um, but I don't think that's going to impact how it goes to the board because I think that's ultimately going to be the board's decision. Thank you for that. Um, and again, just to clarify, um, you know, the vote that I I would like to see taken today um, is just with regard to um, whether or not the subchapter five, uh, as it relates to, I believe it's uh, whatever the, the related subchapter in uh, 57, uh, that, that we make a decision as to whether that's essentially gonna be tackled here uh, or not. Um, and then I think with regard to the other changes to six and seven, uh, would we be on the 10th? That'll give more fo folks more time to look at this crosswalk uh, before they vote on those recommendations. But I see we have two more hands up. So Allison and then Stevie. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I agree with what, what Kirk is suggesting. I, I do feel like we could probably send forth our recommendation and like McCall said it, it may not be presented to the board like this it, but if we had a subcommittee say working on a particular endorsement we're not all going to get back together and vote on that probably so they're going to need to send that recommendation forth and the board's going to or the suspect's going to determine how it's sent to the board I think we have to do what we can do in this task force and let other groups of experts do what they can do if we're gonna say we're not voting on any of the stuff we've worked on over this last couple of months, that feels like a, a shame, you know? And, and so, and I think there's gonna be different groups of experts working on these pieces. I agree with McCall, it shouldn't be presented to the board in piecemeal, but I think we have to do our piece and voting on that is part of that piece. Thanks. Thank you, Stevie. Um, I wanna agree with both Kirk and Allison. I, I think that we can set aside the, uh, the content piece to be looked at by experts, including psychologists and counseling that we find in, in chapter six and seven. I would, as Kirk suggested, like to see us vote on six and seven. Um, and again, as many times as I can reiterate that that's not just my work, that was work from myself and my colleagues at U of M and MSU. But um, I think we can't let all the time we've spent in this process um, fall aside to not get a finished product in some form. But I think from the beginning, we have been clear that we need experts to, to work on the content standards. All right, thank you, Stevie. Curtis. I would agree with Allison, Stevie and Kirk that let's vote on, uh, take separate the content areas out. Let's vote on six and seven and uh, get that done today as like uh, right now. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, I think I'm hearing a, a desire among the task force to go ahead and vote on those specific um, items in six and seven. And I think probably the best way to do that is perhaps um, either Tristan or Jacqueline, uh, I'll stop sharing. Um, and you could bring those that uh, master tracker up. Um, and while that is happening, um, this would probably be a good time to um, just uh, open it. I knew we do have maybe one or two members of the public uh, that are attending today. Uh, and we do need to provide them an opportunity to, to uh, have public comment. So yeah, it would start at uh, 6 604, Stevie? Yes. Would that be the first, that would be the first first uh, area of change. And, and maybe uh, if you could scroll over to where the revised two language is, just so people could see it. Okay, hold on one second. Let me make it a little. And again, if there are members of the public that would like to comment while we're doing this, uh, please consider this uh, time is yours right now. I think Ann had her hand up. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Ann Eubank. I'm the department head um, at MSU Department of Education. Um, this has been a really, really rich conversation this morning. Um, I, I'm in agreement that the task force could vote at this time, and I'd just like to um, support McCall's um, perspective about, um, and Allison's perspective about, you know, the, the process by which these chapters are reviewed by CISPAC and BPE is, that's going to be up to them. So I, I don't think there's harm in voting today. In fact, I think it's a good thing because everybody's worked so hard on this. Um, and and uh, everybody deserves, especially our facilitators, deserves a chance to um, have this hard work uh, presented. Um, one thing that I would recommend in terms of the, you know, the passing of these chapters, either piecemeal or, um, or intact as one package, I'd, I'd recommend that um, maybe legal counsel um, weigh in on this because really where the, the issue is with uh, these chapters um, being passed intact is because they're inextricably linked and there's specific legal language that must be incorporated into the arm. So maybe getting a perspective from legal about the best way to uh, move forward in terms of uh, 57 and 58 would be appropriate. Thanks so much. Thank you for your comment, Anne, and, and I know that OPI Legal will be looking at all of these um, recommendations, just as a side note. Uh, any other public comment? Okay, um, so let's uh, go ahead and take a, um, a vote on uh, six, the recommendations for 604. Um, and uh, Jacqueline, would you would you mind calling on folks and maybe Tristan, you can uh, tally the results? No problem. Sounds okay. Uh, Kirk. Yes. Stevie. Yes. Gail. Yes. Curtis. Sorry. Yes. Mary. Yes. McCall. Yes. Hold on one second. Emily. Yes. Kari. She votes yes via the chat. Yeah, she put it in the chat. Got it. Did I call on Susan? Yes. Okay, I don't think I missed anybody, but if I did, I please vote let yes. me know. This is Allison. Sorry about that. All righty. And, and actually, task. Jacqueline, since you're sharing, I think I can actually do this part. I can see everybody maybe a little easier. Um, okay. So I can do that part. Um, okay. Uh, Tristan, did you? Yep, it passed. Okay. Uh, yes, unanimously. Okay, so maybe we can move down. Just 
So 605, advanced content, pedagogical knowledge. Yep, this is most of it. Okay. If anybody needs the tracker in the chat, I'm sure we can and put I it in there. I believe again, before we vote on this, I need to provide an opportunity for any public comment. Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. <clears throat> Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Kari has put in the chat, uh, yes. So I believe that is uh, unanimous. Yes. I, did, I didn't miss anybody, correct? Correct. Okay. So if we could move down to 606, Advanced Clinical Partnerships and Practice. Uh, before we vote, uh, is there any public comment? Okay, uh, hearing none, um, Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Kari has also voted yes in the chat. So again, I believe we have unanimous. Um, 607, Advanced Candidate Quality Recruitment and Selectivity. Uh, any public comment before we vote? Okay, hearing none. Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Kari has again put in the chat that she votes yes. All right, uh, 608, advanced program impact. Uh, prior to a vote, is there any public comment? Okay, hearing none. Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And again, Kari has uh, indicated a yes vote in the chat. So if we could move down to 609, advanced uh, provider quality assurance and continuous improvement. Uh, before we vote, is there any public comment? Okay, hearing none. Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And we have uh, Kari has again indicated yes uh, in the chat.
Okay, we will not address counseling. About the new standard, Zach. Yeah, the new there's standard, a, yeah, we need to go back up, please. Yes, it's unnumbered, but I imagine that will get taken care of through legal or whatever. Yes, okay. So this is a new standard. Um, it's around uh, EPP uh, capacity and necessary, I guess, requirements, facilities, equipment, supplies. Um, any, anything you want to comment on this, Stevie, before we vote? Just want to tell you that um, CAPE, CAPE is suggesting two new standards. This one, we the group that has been looking at this um, recommends to the committee that it be adopted. It is, um, it is certainly best practice what we're doing right now anyway. So we think that this is important. The other one was more of a financial aid um, standard that we think doesn't apply to all EPPs. So we're, we're recommending this one. Okay, thank you. Is there any public comment on this? Okay, hearing none, Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Kari has again indicated yes in the chat. So now I believe there's just a couple more. Uh, okay, 705, um, school principals, supervisors, and curriculum directors. Um, just a small change in uh, section. Well, there's a few. It's just adding the word uh, well being in a couple sections. Right, you'll see that throughout. Uh, yep, throughout. Uh, any public comment on this before a vote? Okay, hearing none. Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And again, Kari has voted via chat that she says yes. All right, so this is 706. This is uh, with regard to superintendents. Um, any public comment before this vote? Okay, hearing none, Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Uh, Mary. Yes. And Kari has again voted yes via chat. Is that it or is there one or two more? I think that's it. That is um, it. Just a quick note. Um, do we want to take a formal vote to exclude subchapter five just so that's recorded, Kirk? Yeah, uh, I think that we should go back to line 109. Yep. There were two pending in subchapter three, 316 and 317 that I we should vote on. Oh, okay. My apologies. I, I forgot. Those were, were those new recommendations within subchapter three? New standards, 58.316 and 58.317. Line 109. Yeah. Okay. So good catch. 
Yes, thank you, Kirk. Okay, so a new standard. Um, so I think this just kind of mirrors what's in what's recommended in uh, six with respect to subchapter three. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so three. Uh, so three sixteen new standard. Uh, any public comment? Okay, hearing none. Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Gail. Sorry. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Kari has again voted yes via chat. So then the other one is 317. Yes. Only for EPPs seeking access to Title IV funds. Four funds. Any and public comment on this before a vote? Dak, let me let me comment. This is the one I talked about before in in um, in the 600 series. This is the one that my colleagues and I did not recommend because it doesn't apply to all EPs, EPPs. So um, I, I, I don't know why we left it here. I don't think we meant to, but um, this is the one I just mentioned that we excluded from, from the 600 series. Okay, we'll be striking it out and deleting it. Thank you. So I think that's it for voting on the changes that have been proposed thus yeah. far. Um, so um, I think it would behoove us maybe just to take a quick vote on this, this question of exclusion of the uh, specific endorsement areas as outlined in subchapter five, uh, just so that we are uh, officially wrapping up our recommendations. And Zach, let's include psychologists and counselors from the advanced program. Thank you, yes. And that would include also that um, psychologists and school counselors would also uh, be included even though those are in uh, subchapter seven, I believe. Yes. Um, so um, before, before we take a vote on that, any public comment? Hey, Zach, can I ask a question really quick one more time, just so that I have it? Um, tell me one more time slowly so I can type it out what we're voting on exactly. Sure. Um, so we are voting uh, to exclude uh, the endorsement areas in subchapter five. And also, could you, Jacqueline, could you scroll down to the actual subchapters for... Uh, school counselors and psychologists, just so I can give you the right numbers. What, where it would be, I believe it's in subchapter seven. Okay, I keep looking in five, sorry. Yep, uh, here we are. Yeah, so um, that's, I think, it's seven. above there, maybe it's in six. It's 7.05. 1019. Line item 1019. Oh, goodness. Kirk's got it memorized. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So 707, we would not be voting on 707. And then what's the one right below it? I think there is it. Okay, it's up above. 706, I think. 706. The one we just. Oops, so nope. it'll be the endorsement areas. Nope, and so we have 705. And. Um, 707 and then what school counselors it's on line 910 10 keep going up 10. there we go 610 610 is that sorry tristan that was a little convoluted does that answer your question Okay, so let me, if I read, if I read to you, so task force votes on the exclusion of endorsement areas in subchapter five, as well as school counselors, 1058, 610, and psychologists, 
1058, 706, and 707. Mm, I think 706. Let me just, just make sure. Just 707. Just yeah. 707. We did yeah. vote on 707. Superintendents, we did uh, take a vote. Okay. I'd and Zach, I'd, I'd like to add that to that motion that we are we are excluding them um, to allow time for um, content specialists to review them. We're not just moving them off the plate. Okay. I second that motion. All right. Is there any public comment before we take a vote? Okay, so do you guys want me to read it one more time to you? Sure. Yeah. I just like, I want to make sure that it's right. So task force votes to on the exclusion to allow time for specialists to review of endorsement areas in September 5, as well as school counselors in 1058-610 and psychologists 1058-707. Okay. I think you've captured it. Hearing no public comment, Stevie. Yes. Kirk. Yes. Curtis. Yes. McCall. Yes. Allison. Yes. Susan. Yes. Gail. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mary. Yes. And I see that Kari um, has voted yes via chat. So I think that wraps up the vote and uh, that the work of this task force is concluded for, for this, th this time period at least. Um, so uh, yeah, so we went a little Thank Sorry. You. Just went on mute, Zach. I see that. Tristan's tired of hearing about hearing from me. No, I, I think it was I who did it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I do just want to say uh, really quick, um, I do appreciate everybody uh, being a part of this process. Um, not an easy process, but an important one. And again, that everybody uh, came here uh, in the spirit of um, trying to improve the educational outcomes of Montana students. Uh, and so I appreciate everybody moving forward in a positive way in that spirit. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with all of you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mr. Chair, before we close up. Kirk had something to say, I think. I would want to offer a word of thanks to Stevie Ellison and Curtis, as well as your colleagues at U of M for the heavy lifting on all of those sections to align with CAPE standards and modernize the language within Chapter 58. Uh, and also want to give kudos to uh, the staff, Zach and Tristan, for the alignment and uh, everybody who worked um, at the office on uh, trying to get this complicated matter aligned so that we were able to make reasonable, uh, to vote on reasonable recommendations that had deep review. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank yes, you. Thank welcome. You. You're welcome, Kirk. It's what you pay us for. We'll be looking for the check in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we are officially done. Thank you again, everybody. Uh, please be well. You too. Thank, thank you. you.